All right, Matthew chapter 11, we're obviously, in every chapter, we're picking up where we left off the previous week from the previous chapter. And in chapter number 10, Jesus was sending his disciples out and he told them, if you remember, you know, don't worry, you don't have to bring your purse or an extra pair of coat or an extra coat or extra shoes or anything like that. You know, you don't have to bring extra stuff. Basically, go out. Here's what you're going to do when you come into a city. You know, if they receive you, great. Stay there. You know, preach the gospel. If not, shake the dust off your feet and keep going. So he's basically commissioning them to go out and do a job. And then chapter 11 picks up. Now where he goes and he's going to go and start teaching in the city. So he sent his disciples off. Chapter 11, verse number one starts off. It says, and it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his 12 disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. Now, when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto them, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? And there's a real interesting story here in, in Matthew chapter 11 because we have, you know, John the Baptist up to this point, he had been, you know, preaching in the wilderness, he'd been baptizing people, he had gathered a great following, a lot of people were listening to his preaching, a lot of people were getting saved, he was preparing the way for the Lord, Jesus shows up on the scene, he baptizes Jesus Christ, and then he starts pointing people, behold the Lamb of God, right, follow him, follow Jesus, he must increase, I must decrease, and he keeps pointing people to Jesus Christ until ultimately, oh, his, his ministry continues, but it's, it's shrinking because Jesus is growing. And, and the whole point, and John knows this, that it's not about, about himself, it's about Jesus Christ. So he, he wants this to happen. Ultimately, John the Baptist gets arrested and imprisoned and ultimately beheaded. But while he's in prison now, he has this moment where, you know, up to this point, it was pretty clear that Jesus was the Christ. You know, he, he was already, he already knew that uh, the Spirit of God was going to descend upon him and that the person that, that descended upon him, he's like, that's the Son of God. He, there's a lot of things that he already knew that was that information that was given to him of, of who uh, the Christ was going to be and that, and that that was Jesus. But now he's been sitting in a prison cell. Now he's had some bad things happen and now he's just been sitting there and kind of observing, if you will, based on the things that he's been hearing, what's been happening with Jesus while he's in prison. And he starts to question and doubt and wonder and go, and he, and he sends to Christ, you know, he's not just, you know, when he has this question, he's going to Jesus with the question, well, are, are you, you know, are you the Christ or do we wait and look for another? I mean, you know, are we somehow mistaken on this? Is this not right? And what we see here is that Jesus wasn't exactly what John the Baptist expected. His expectations were different. Because if his expectations were being completely met, then he wouldn't have ever doubted. He wouldn't have ever questioned. The fact that he's doubting, the fact that he's questioning and just going and sending people off and going, you know, are, is this right? Do we, is there someone else coming or are you, are you the guy? Shows us, it demonstrates Something wasn't adding up for him with his own expectations. Now, this is a problem that people have even to this day. And this is a problem I think everybody has had, that you have these false expectations or beliefs about who Jesus Christ really is. Now, I'm sure there's some things that we're wrong about, about Jesus Christ and about who he really is. I think everybody, to some level, to some degree, is going to have areas where, man, I just, I thought Jesus was going to be like this, and, and it turns out I was wrong. Uh, if John the Baptist can, can have, you know, some doubts or have some inaccurate expectations, you know, I think it's fair to say that, that we could also probably have the same type of thing. Now, I don't, j just because I say that, that doesn't mean well, then we have no idea who Jesus is. That's ridiculous, of course. I mean, we're talking about getting into finer details and, you know, but some people, and the reason why I say that is because some people today are just completely wrong and, and grossly, you know, their, their expectations of who Jesus Christ is are, are just way off the deep end. Even to the point of just being another person. You know, when, when you claim you know Jesus, 
but you don't believe he's the son of God or you don't believe he's God in the flesh, you don't believe he's, he's part of the three in one, the Holy Trinity, the triune God, then you have a different Jesus. You don't know who Jesus is. I mean, you really, you really just, that's just too far off of who Jesus is when you don't even believe that he is de deity. But other people, too, they have this picture in their mind and they have allowed the world and Hollywood and media to kind of tell them who Jesus is. When you have unbelieving atheists and people who hate God trying to tell you, Jesus, if, you if you're believing and agreeing with what they're saying, you have a wrong expectation of Jesus because these guys, they don't know Jesus. They don't know him at all. They might think they know him. They might think they know who he is. The, the, as much as they knew about him, they rejected. Or they, you know, they don't want to know. They don't really know who Jesus is. So I'm not going to get my beliefs from them either. Now, I think another, there's another story when I was preparing for a sermon and kind of meditating God's word and thinking about how John, you know, he had a, a different expectation of who Jesus was. We see something very similar with Naaman the Syrian. And if you want to turn back to that story, I'm going to read a few verses from it. It's in 2 Kings chapter number 5. Because Naaman also was someone when he went to Elisha because he was told he could be healed. Naaman was, was a leper. Naaman had leprosy and it was told that, that he can go into Israel and there was a prophet there, a prophet of the Lord named Elisha that would actually be able to heal him. And this was an amazing thing, right? So of course, he, he makes the journey to go see Elisha and in his mind as he's going there, he's already thought of what's going to happen, what's it going to be like when he sees this man of God, he's going to strike his hands together and he's going to lay hands on him and he's going to be you know, Whatever it was that he had set up in his mind was not what happened at all. Not at all. And what happens as a result, because this man, you know, he failed to meet his expectation, he was ready to just leave in a rage, just really angry and just completely miss out on the healing that he could have received. We're going to read the story. It's in 2 Kings chapter 5. Look at verse number 9. The Bible says, So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. So he shows up at Elisha's front door. Verse 10, And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. So he shows up, he makes this journey, and you know, Naaman's this important guy. Right? He's like the captain of the host. For, you know, he's, he shows up and he's expecting to at least be met and greeted by Elisha. And instead, Elisha just sends a messenger to him and saying, oh yeah, you're here. Okay, yeah, go ahead and wash in Jordan seven times and you'll be clean. And he's just like, what? You know, I came all this way. I'm looking for Elijah. I'm looking to be healed. And this guy just comes to me and says, Elisha said to go wash in the, in, in the river Jordan. And then and he responds with this. He says in verse uh, 11, But Naaman was wroth, so it means he was angry, he had wrath, and went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. I mean, he was livid. He was so angry at the fact that Elijah didn't come out. Man, I thought he was going to do this. I thought he was going to do this. What was he expecting? He was expecting some big religious experience, right? And this big show and kind of theatrics. And that's not what happened. And people have this sense today of thinking, well, if God's involved somehow, then it has to be like this big show. And this is where the Pentecostal crowd falls into. They think that like every week, every service, there's got to be something big going on. And the guy up front waving his hands up. Hey, oh man, and I could feel the spirit. Can you feel the spirit? And he's just going on and on. And, and people are just, you know, eating it up. And you've got the music playing. 
and, and you know, people are falling down on the ground and just all this commotion. And they go, wow, look, well, that just must be God. You know, that's, these are their expectations of what they have in their mind of what God must be like. It's completely false. Like, we don't see any of that going on in Scripture. You don't see any of that craziness, circus act being carried out in the Bible. In fact, what we see is an event like this where Elijah's like, yeah, I'm a pretty busy guy here. Just go tell them to go wash and they'll be healed, right? And, and, <laughs> and that's what happens. Obviously, there's many times where people are laying their hands on and stuff. I'm, you know, but this was done on purpose, too, though. This was done to prove a point. This is in here for our learning and for our edification, this, uh, this story about Naaman, as well as the story about John. I think they're very similar. Not to the same extent, but I think they're very similar in, in kind of the root of, of having a certain expectation. Naaman has a certain expectation, and because of that expectation, he almost just completely missed out on being healed. It took his servant to be like, well, wait a minute, you know, because he's, he's, <laughs> he's thinking like, the Jordan River, like, I've seen the rivers in Israel. They're not that great, right? Like, what's so special about these rivers? I'd much rather go to one of these rivers of Damascus that are way better than these rivers. And his servant's like, well, you know, if he told you to do something like, like really hard or really difficult, wouldn't you have done it to, to be cured of leprosy? Like, how much more something as simple as just, just, I mean, just do it. Like, why don't you just do it and see if it works? So he ends up doing it. Of course, he gets healed, then he's real happy. You know, he's first he's in a rage, and then he's like, here, have it. You know, I brought all this stuff, and he's willing to give them all kinds of money and change of clothing and stuff. But what a shame that would have been for him to just, just turn around because his expectations weren't met, because he had a false view of who Elisha was supposed to be. John the Baptist had a false view of who Christ was going to be. And I think a lot of the Jews at that time had a false view of what Christ was going to do when he came to this earth. And you know what? I don't think we could really hold that against them because they didn't have all the scriptures of the New Testament opening up their minds and all these extra revelations just spelling out everything about Jesus Christ and who he was and what he was going to do. They had the Old Testament. They were seeing darkly right? They had dark sayings. They could understand a lot, but they still didn't have all the revelation. So when you have prophecies of both the, the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ, and they're not all easily just spelled out for you, especially not having the, the, the knowledge of history of Jesus Christ already having come and lived and died like we have, it's a lot more difficult for them to kind of piece it together and have a certain expectation. So that's one of the reasons why I think their expectations were wrong. So I'm not trying to say that John was just like Naaman the Syrian. I'm just saying they both had false expectations. So what we see here is John in prison and probably thinking, now I don't know this, this is my opinion, I'm speculating at this point, probably thinking that Jesus was going to set up his kingdom on the earth, yet he's in prison, right? That Jesus is the savior of Israel. He's the savior of his people. He came unto his people and he spoke, you know, like, well, then what's John doing? Like this great guy that's been doing nothing but promoting him, probably one of the best people that was a big promoter of Jesus' ministry. He's just sitting in a prison cell somewhere when he could be out doing more work, helping out, whatever, how is it that Jesus isn't freeing him out of prison? And I think all of that is starting to cause him to think like, well, wait a minute, is this the way things are supposed to go down? This doesn't seem right to me. I thought by now you'd have already been, you know, kind of coming into power and everything else. Like that's probably where his false expectation has come from. And just like there's going to be Christians in our day or in, in future times to come, that this false expectation that Jesus is going to be coming for them before any real tribulation and hard times come, and they're going to be caught off guard. John the Baptist seemed a little caught, caught off guard, and it caused them to doubt, right? And when people start going through a hard time, as John is cast into prison, they may get caught off guard and start to doubt and wonder. Now, 
we don't want to be like that. We, wa we want to have that solid, strong faith unto the end. But here's a cool thing about Jesus Christ. So let's look at how Jesus answers, because John sent his disciples to go and ask him these questions. And then Jesus gives them an answer. Look at verse number four. The Bible says, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. So basically tell him everything. He's not just telling him to say this. He's saying, tell him what you're seeing, what you're hearing. Like, like tell him the truth. Tell him this is all what's happening. Here's what you see. Here's what you hear. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. And the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor of the gospel preach to them. He's saying, you're seeing and hearing all this stuff. Just to confirm and reinforce John, look, this is what's happening. Of course this is the Son of God. Of course Jesus is the Christ. There is no one else that you need to be looking for because all of this stuff is happening and this is fulfilling Scripture that he should know very well at this point and, and saying th this is what's going on. Okay. Then he follows. You know, he gives them the evidence. I mean, that's enough. Like, yes, th uh, this is right. Verse 6, though, he says, And blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. Now, as I was mentioning, I think John might have been offended in Jesus somehow. This is part of his false expectation that, Jesus, that John was offended. Because why else would Jesus say, add that at the end, blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. That John was offended probably because he's left in that prison cell. So, so that, that he's offended that Jesus didn't come and get him out and whatever, that he has been offended. Now, that term and that phrase being used of being offended in him is also found in the book of John chapter 6 when Jesus is teaching his disciples and others about him being the bread of life. So if you remember that, uh, that chapter or that story when Jesus is going through saying, except you eat my, my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part with me. You know, and he's really kind of preaching hard on, on him being the bread of life, the bread which came down from heaven. And, and that whole chapter, there's a real long chapter in John chapter 6. He goes into that, but after, like, as he's preaching that, his disciples, I'm just going to read for you from verse number 60 of John chapter 6. It says, Many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? So they're just like, basically, I don't, I don't know what he's talking about. We don't know what he's saying. This is kind of weird. And then Jesus answers, it says in verse 61, when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, doth this offend you? So, one of the reasons why I'm bringing this up is because when we think of the word like offending someone, it's, it's not exactly the same as, as what the scripture is talking about here. But I think this will help us to get a, a good understanding. He said his disciples were murmuring, like, well, man, this is, a, you know, this is a hard saying. I don't know who could even understand this. What's he talking about? You know, that's murmuring. Murmuring is not a good attribute to have in scripture, right? It, it's this just kind of talking under your breath, murmuring, oh, man, you know. And he asks them, well, does this offend you? And at the same time, he's, you know, in Matthew, he's talking to John saying, you know, hey, blessed is he that's not offended. So we see this used a couple times. And um, again, I think this is just because John the Baptist was, just like his disciples were confused about him being the, the bread of life and starting to question and wonder and kind of just talk, like, what is, what is this? Starting to murmur. This is what John the Baptist is doing in prison. He's kind of starting to murmur. He's starting to wonder and question and, I don't, you know, what's going on? I don't, the same way his disciples were confused about him being the bread of life is kind of the same way that John the Baptist is going, well, why am I still in prison? And are you really, you know, the guy we're looking for? Which is why he says, you know, blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. And basically instructing John, hey, don't be offended in me. Just have faith. Believe. Look, look all this stuff is happening. You know this is right. Just, just, just trust me, believe, and, and keep doing what you're doing. And, um, but after this, so Jesus follows this up then because that's the instruction that he's given John's disciples to bring back to him in a prison. When they leave, Jesus addresses then everybody else that's, that's around and you know, the people who he's teaching to. 
and begins to talk about John the Baptist. And that even though John was kind of doubting and questioning, Jesus still shows John a lot of honor. And that's the type of person that Jesus is. And that's, that's one of the things that we should love about God. That even through times of, of question or doubt or whatever, he, he still you know, isn't just turning his back on you, you know, oh man, I can't believe that John would, and just, and just start trashing John's name. Right. He doesn't do that at all. And, you know, we can take a lesson from that too. When someone just seems a little shaky on something, that doesn't mean all of a sudden just start blasting them. Yeah, you know, we, we, don't, we don't do that. I mean, some, some people do that. Some people, you just, man, you're just not quite lockstep and just right up to where my expectation of you needs to be. And they're going to start trashing people's names. It happens with, with some of the pastors. I think even just recently, you know, with some of the events that have been happening with, with Pastor Anderson and stuff, it's like he's doing what he's going to do. Maybe some people have a false expectation of, what, of what he, who he is and what he's going to do. But as soon as they see something they don't like, it's just, well, now all the railing starts or all the, you know, it's like, man, cut the guy some slack. And I'm not saying he's like doubting or anything. It's just, you know, people have this false, like, look, okay, fine. You don't have to be on board with everything that he says or whatever, but is it really worth the, the you know, people being just hypercritical on this stuff? I don't, I don't think so. But um, anyways, I, Let's get back to the, uh, to the chapter here because he starts to address the crowd here about John the Baptist. In verse 7 he says, And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, What went ye out in the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. So what I think is also interesting about the way uh, Jesus starts to respond to these people that are listening about John the Baptist is he's kind of addressing their false expectations about what a prophet is and what a prophet would look like and a, who a prophet should be, right? Because they're saying, well, what did you go out for to see? Someone who's just shaking with the wind and just, well, okay, so it's not popular to teach on this, so I'm not going to touch that. It's you know, that's not who John the Baptist was. He wasn't a reed just, just tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. He, he had a backbone, he had a spine, and he's just going to preach, thus saith the Lord. That's who he was. He says, what were you in for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? You know, oh, he's just all pampered and prettied up and looks really nice and, you know. No. The guy was rough. He had, he had uh, you know, camel's hair and a leather girdle and ate locusts and honey. That's who he is. He says, behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. You know, he's not, he's not this earthly royalty. He's a man of God. And a lot of people have this false view. It just, just like people have this false view of Jesus being this, you know, never really saying much of anything, never getting upset, never getting angry, just walking around and... almost looking like he's, he's high or something. Because that's the way that Hollywood would portray Jesus Christ. People who have no idea who he is, that's how they portray him. But when Jesus is asking his disciples, well, hey, who do, people, who do men say that I am? Some say Jeremiah. Some say Elijah. You know, people are, are guessing these prophets of all time. And when you read the Bible about who these prophets are, it's not the way Hollywood portrays it. They're going like, man, he's just like, this guy and that guy and these, this prophet that, you know, did all these, these mighty things. Having the right expectations. We need to make sure we're in our Bibles and, and reading and studying and getting to know God, getting to know Jesus through his word and not allowing all the outside influences to mold your view, to bring you into some false expectations about who he is let this word show you who Jesus is. 
And not just by studying, but by doing the things that you learn and putting them into practice will help you to have a clearer picture of who Jesus Christ is. Because you don't just get it from reading. You won't understand what you're reading if you don't do also. You can't have the full, a, a, a more complete, fuller understanding of God's word unless you actually put it into practice. That is essential. You have to do that. Continuing on here, verse number nine. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, and which shall prepare thy way before thee. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. His disciples just came to him asking, Are you, know, are you he that should come, or we look for another? And Jesus turns around and tells people, You know what? Among them that are born of women, there's not risen a greater than John the Baptist. He doesn't overlook all the good that John has done and all the faith that he had and everything that he did up to that point because he had this moment where he was a little bit wrong and a little bit shaky on it. He doesn't just throw everything away. And he goes on to just still encourage, he encourages John, he gives him, he tells him what he needs to hear in prison and then tells the crowd, hey, look, this guy is a great man of God. He's not some reed shaking in the wind. You know, he's, he's not this pushover. And, uh, and it says, notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Now, why does he say that? Because John the Baptist still has his flesh. Because any sinful, even the greatest man on earth, right, that still has sin, is not as great as someone in heaven who has no sin, who doesn't have the sinful flesh, because they're in the spirit all the time all the time. So even the person doing all of this here, they, they, we, still are, we still are bound by this flesh. And it shows through here. But, man, John the Baptist, what a, what a great guy. I mean, that's one of the reasons why we're known as Baptists. Because of John the Baptist. But let's keep reading here. Uh, verse number 12. Bible reads, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. Now I think what he's trying to do is also explain why John's in prison. Because he's saying, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven have suffereth violence. The kingdom of heaven is suffering means like you're allowing violence, and the violence taking it by force. So men are doing what they want to do. And God is basically allowing this to happen. And he says, for all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And look at how all the prophets were treated. They all suffered persecution. That, you know, many of them went into prison and were held in dungeons and, you know, had bad things happen to them and had the government coming after them. You know, this is something that's happened throughout history. And the violent, they just go and try to take it by force. And they're going to try to force their way into doing things. And you know what? God allows for that to happen many times. So John is no different. John's still in good company with all the other prophets with this happening. In verse 14, Jesus continues, And if you will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. So the Bible prophesied the coming of Elijah before Jesus Christ shows up. And that was a prophecy that, that, uh, that the people knew. Okay? And, they, and they were looking for at the time before, because people were looking for Christ and they were looking for, say, okay, well, you know, are you Elijah? And that's what they would ask John the Baptist even. Jesus said, he that hears, I'm here. Now, to flip over real quick to John chapter 1, because John was asked this very question. Saying, well, are you Elias? And when the New Testament says Elias, it's just the, the Greek way of this, the Greek form of the same name for Elijah that we see in, uh, in the Old Testament uh, that was translated from Hebrew. So translating from Greek into English, translating from Hebrew into English, this is, what, this is what we're left with. These are the names that they used. Same person, 
Uh, nothing to be you know, confused about or, or worried about. It's, it's just a different spelling of the name. And if you see Elysius, that's Elisha, or Elias is Elijah. You know, our names are real similar, but that extra S in there will tell you it's Elisha if, when you see that in the New Testament. So in John chapter 1, though, this is where we're going to see, uh, starting in verse number 19, where John is being questioned about being Elijah because people are looking for, well, wait, who are you? Are you the Christ? Are you Elijah? Who are you, John? They're trying to figure it out because he's baptizing. He's doing things different. He's got this crowd going. He's really on fire. It's like there's something, something special about this guy. But, but what is it exactly, right? How does he fit in? John uh, 1, 19, the Bible says, and this is the record of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. So right off the bat, we see he's, he's not claiming to be Jesus. He's not claiming to be the Christ. And that's, that's not who I am. And they asked him, what then? Okay, if you're not the Christ, then who are you? What then? Art thou Elias? And he saith, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, no. So he's very clear saying, I'm not Elijah either. I'm not the Christ. I'm not Elijah. It says, then said the end him, well, who art thou? That we may give an answer to, him that, to them that sent us. What sayest thou of thyself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. So he's recognizing that he's playing a very important role here in the fulfillment of prophecy of Scripture. He just doesn't realize that at the same time he's fulfilling the prophecy of being, you know, kind of having the spirit of Elijah on the earth as he prepares the way for the Lord. He didn't make that connection. So that's why he says, well, no, that's not who I am. Now, the reason why I bring this up, though, is that because just because John said he wasn't doesn't mean he wasn't, right? This isn't a contradiction or an error in the Scripture. This is, the Scripture is telling us in John chapter 1, this is what John thought. This is what John actually said. And he said it sincerely. He didn't think he was Elijah. But Jesus is the one who says, hey, if you'll receive it, you know, if you actually believe this, receive it, hear it. This is Elias, which was for to come. Jesus said he is the fulfillment of the prophecy of Elijah coming before the Christ. That is who he is. Now, who should we believe? Well, obviously, we're going to believe Jesus Christ. If John's saying, no, I'm not Elijah, but Jesus is saying, this is Elijah, of course it is. Of course it is. So people can fulfill things and not even completely know that they're doing it. Another point and one of the things I love about this passage here and in, in, in this interaction, how John doesn't know it, even though he is, I think this applies perfectly with the King James Bible and the translators because people always want to try to point to when, when, you say, when you say, well, I believe that the King James Bible is inerrant. It's perfect. You know, it's preserved for us. God preserved his word through the King James Bible. And people will say, well, you know that not even the translators believed that it was perfect. And that's what they'll throw out because you say, well, you believe it's perfect? Yeah, I believe it's inerrant. They say, well, not even, the not even the people who translated thought it was without error. Even they thought that there would be problems and mistakes and, and you know, read their forward. Well, they don't have to believe that they were instruments being used of God to preserve his word and to keep it in, you know, and to have it in the English language inerrant. They don't have to believe that in order for it to be true. Because God's word says that he's going to preserve his word from this generation forever. So it's going to be preserved one way or another. And it doesn't matter whether the person who's doing the preservation, the literal human instrument, realizes that that is actually what they're doing or not in order to do it. John didn't realize he actually was Elijah, which was for to come. He didn't realize it, yet he still was. Jesus gives us that information. So no, not everyone has to be worried. God even uses unsaved people for his will to get done. So... There you go. It doesn't mean that, oh, well, they're unsaved because well, God can't use them. Well, no, God does use them. Many instances of that. Let's go back to Matthew 11. Matthew 11, we're going to pick up here in verse number 16. The Bible says, But whereunto shall I liken this generation? 
It is like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows, and saying, We have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned unto you, and ye have not lamented. So he's bringing his parable here, talking about the generation he's living in, the people that are around at that time, and saying, You know what? You're just like these kids. You're like these kids in the marketplace, and they're playing some music on their pipe, and they're saying, well, wait a minute, how come you guys aren't dancing, huh? I mean, I'm playing the music, why aren't you dancing? And then uh, the same way, well, we've mourned unto you, why aren't you lamenting with us? Why aren't you sorry for you? Why aren't you behaving the way that I want you to behave? Why aren't you doing the things that I want you to do? Hey, this is what I'm doing, you should be doing this. Again, back to the expectations, right? And now he's going to expound on what he means and what they're thinking and what they're looking at and how they're really just being hypocritical at the same time. He says in verse 18, For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He hath the devil. So John, I mean, he's, he, like I said before, his diet is real minimal. He's this minimalist out in the wilderness, you know, eating locusts and honey, and he's not having juice, wine. I mean, he's not having anything. He's basically living off of probably water and these bugs and honey and, just, you know, like a real, real, real simple diet. And they're like, well, that guy's just crazy. He's got a devil, right? I mean, that guy, you know, he's not indulging in any type of food or drink or anything. I mean, that guy is just, and they, and, and they see that and they go, oh, well, he's just nuts. But then on the other hand, you've got Jesus Christ living I, I would, what I would call maybe a more normal lifestyle in the sense of like, he's eating regular meals, he's hanging out, he's going to feasts, he's, you know, John the Baptist was out in the wilderness just, just preaching, you know, hardcore, right? He's just out there. Jesus is living a more normal life. And then he says, he says, well, the son of man came eating and drinking and they say, behold, a man gluttonous and a wine bibber. So they're having problems with it either way. Like that you just can't satisfy these people. You know, one guy comes this way and you're going to criticize them for that. This guy comes this way and you're going to criticize them for that. It's because you just don't want to hear it at all. Because you have your expectations and saying, well, this is the way that we want you to be. And if you're not like that, then, you know, we will have nothing to do with you. And unfortunately, too many people have that attitude. This is my expectation. And if it's not like this, I want to have no part of it. So a man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and wine bitter, a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified of her children. The children of wisdom know, and, um, and they know better. They know the Son of Man and John the Baptist were both right. <laughs> They're both doing the right thing. Whereas these people, this generation that Jesus is teaching and you know, preaching to, they think they're just both wrong. And they, they, they just can't have it either way. Let's keep reading here. Well, before I even get on to that, I forgot. I, I, again, I, I make notes on things I want to talk about as I prepare. And uh, this does kind of remind me also of our political climate. And what, what I mean by that is you know, when Jesus is saying, well, John came, he's not eating or drinking, and you're like, he's got a devil, and the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and you say, oh, well, you're wine, baby, and you're gluttonous. This is like the Republicans that get mad at the things that the Democrats do, right? Until it's a Republican doing them, right. and, then, and, then, and then they're okay with it. Then they're not going to say anything wrong about it. The, 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 the actual action could be the same exact thing, but if it's someone that they like, you know, they're not going to say anything about it. They're going to be like, oh, yeah, this is great. Isn't it crazy? But if it's someone they don't like, it's, oh, man, can you believe he's doing that? It's hypocrisy. It's stupidity. So if it were a Pharisee out there eating locusts, right, drinking water, you know, they wouldn't say that guy had a devil. But it's John the Baptist, you know, and it's pretty, oh, man, that guy's crazy. They would never dream of calling the Pharisee a, a wine bibber or a glutton if he were found just having a meal like Jesus Christ was. But they're going to say that to him. Why? Because they don't like him. They're not on his team. They're not on their team. He's, you know, 
He's an adversary. And that's what this stupid false left-right paradigm does. And it amazes me that people can't see through the hypocrisy and still just cheer for their team as if any of those people that have a D or an R by their name in our government actually have real values and, and, and care about like any type of, of intellectual you know, uh, uh, belief of, no, this is the way we should do things because it's right. No, they don't care. It's all a game. It's a game for them to get power and to keep power. That's all it is. They don't have any real moral morals or moral objections. They're the ones, are the reeds that are shaken in the wind. The only reason why you have these and ours is because it just depends on what area of the, of the country they live in and who their support's going to be. Who's going to support me the best? Well, then I better say this and this and this and this and this so that I could try to get the most votes to put me into power so that I could make a bunch of money and, and have this job of ruling over people. It's not because they actually believe in those things. <laughs> if you think they actually believe in those things, man, I'm sorry. Do a little bit of research. And, and nowadays it's even easier because we've got the internet to to get the people saying one thing one place and another thing another place. It's the same person saying two opposite things to different groups of people at different times. And, and oh, well, why did you know, oh, well, I can't change my mind about something? Well, why did you change your mind? They're not going to have a good answer for you. Why do you change your mind that abortion all of a sudden is wrong? No one's going to say because it's, a, it's an evil and a really wicked thing and, the, and God's going to punish people because it's murder. You never hear some politician talking like that. Amen. They'll just say, oh, well, you know, I just don't, I don't think it's right. I, I did a little bit more research. I just don't think it's right. You know, something stupid that's not like a real genuine answer because they're actually believing something and just standing for what they believe. No politician stands for what they believe. It's a big joke. I have a lot more respect for people who disagree with my opinion or belief, but they're true to it, than to someone who's just going to say whatever people want to hear. Right. Anyways, I don't want to get far off onto the, onto the political stuff because it's all just a joke anyways. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 20, the Bible says, Then began he to abrade the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. And this touches on what I was just preaching about. Uh, I just brought this up. I think it was on Sunday. So some of the most mighty works that Jesus had done, because he was doing works in different areas. Some places he did more than others. And these are some areas where he says some of his most mighty works, you know, probably people being raised from the dead or people, you know, just a, a ton of people being healed. Whatever the case may be, he starts, you know, abrading these cities because they had all this happen, yet they're still not repentant. They're still not receiving him. They're still not believing on him. They're still not trusting him. They're just continuing on. He says, Woe unto thee, Chorazin. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ash. He said, these other people, if they had the same benefit that you have of receiving this, you know, these people would have repented a long time ago. And yet you are not repentant. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And now Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which had been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. Again, this has to do with the works that Jesus did. There's so much evidence there to prove He's the Son of God, and that people need to repent. And they just wouldn't acknowledge it. Yeah. Wouldn't even acknowledge it. Just, just, they'll find some excuse to not believe in Christ. Yeah. He's saying, these other wicked cities, Sodom, wicked, Tyre and Sidon, wicked. He's saying, they would have repented. They would have had, you know, if they would have seen this, but so, so how bad are you when you're being compared to these places and you've had all of this 
all of this given to you, all of this evidence, all of, all of these things, all of these miracles that you've seen, that you've witnessed, it's going to be a, a, a sad day for you when you go to hell. I don't want to get too far into that. I covered that in a previous sermon. Let's look at verse number 25. We're almost done here. Verse number 25, at that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. And this is one of the ways that God acts. So when he talks about you've, you've hidden these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes, this is talking about the you know, the, the Pharisees and these people who, who were real lifted up in themselves and trusted in their degrees and their education and their, you know, how smart they are. And they look down on people. Oh, you common man, you peons. Yeah, what could you know? And he's saying, you know what? The real wisdom, the wisdom of God, God's just given that wide open to the humble to the lowly, to the common man, to your average person. You know what? God's willing and just loves to give his knowledge and his wisdom on all those people. And you could completely understand without having to be in the, the scribe school of, of uh, whatever, the, uh, of Phariseeism. You, <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to be involved in, in that in order to understand these things, that God's truths are available to everybody. And in fact... Those people that are so lifted up because they think they have so much wisdom that's puffed them up, God hides it from them. So you think you're so smart? I'm not going to allow you to understand what my word says. You need to be brought low and then you'll get it. Then you'll be allowed to understand what the word means. So these people who are all proud and lifted up, I'll tell you what, there, there's, there is a very good group of people that I'm not going to go to to get my Bible doctrine from. When you find someone that's writing books, I'm not saying it's wrong to write books, but teaching, creating videos, whatever it is, and they're just completely lifted up and full of pride, don't get your teaching from those people. Don't, don't get Bible, try to get Bible knowledge for them because they don't have it. They don't have it. God's revealed these things unto babes. But to the wise and prudent, no, he's hidden it from them. The Bible says in verse 27, All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Let's finish up here, verse number 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And this falls in perfectly with my sermon on, on the peace of God which passeth all understanding. Because he's talking to you, hey, you're working, you're, you're laboring, you, you've, got, you've got a heavy job, you're heavy laden. He says, I'll give you rest. Just come unto me. You don't have to work your way into heaven. Just come unto me. You could rest. Jesus Christ is our rest. Jesus Christ is a picture of the Sabbath. That's why, in case you're wondering, and I'm not going to preach the whole sermon on the Sabbath, but you usually can. We don't observe the Sabbath day anymore in the New Testament because that aspect of God's law has been fulfilled. The Sabbath day, you're supposed to work six days and you rest on the seventh day and you're not supposed to do any works at all. That's the way that the Sabbath was designed. The reason why we don't observe the seventh day or the Sabbath day as just being completely dedicated to rest, as God's law said, is because that was a picture that was represented of Jesus Christ. And when Jesus Christ finished all the work that he did for us, when he came to this earth, when he performed all the miracles, when he was hung up on the cross, when he shed his blood, when his soul went into hell, and he rose again from the dead, and he sprinkled his blood on the, on the mercy seat of God, he did everything, all the work that was necessary for our salvation so we could just completely rest in him. And the same way that you had to completely rest on the Sabbath day is how much we completely rest in Christ. That there is zero work being done for us to have that rest in, in our salvation through Christ, just as God was commanding there should be zero work done on the Sabbath day. And that's what, the, what that pictures and represents. And Jesus is saying here, hey, come unto me, all you that labor, you're heavy laden. I'll give you rest. But then he follows up with this, he says in verse 29, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. 
I thought you said rest. Now you're telling me to take up a yoke. What's a yoke? A yoke is something that ties together like oxen, right? You have two oxen ready to plow a field and do some work. You put a yoke on them to keep them together and to keep them working and moving forward at the same pace at the same time, right? They're holding each other kind of in line with each other. You're saying, you just, you just talked about giving me rest. Now you're talking about work? Yeah, because just like Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, is followed up with, for we are his workmanship, created for him unto good works. We're created unto, do, you know, we're supposed to do good works. So we come to Jesus, we receive the rest of our salvation, and then he says, well, take your, your, my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And we can remember that too. The, the yoke that Jesus has for us and his burden is light. It's, it's, really not, it's really not that difficult what Jesus is asking us to do. I mean, definitely salvation. Look, if you look at this verse and you say that all three verses are talking about salvation, that's fine. You know, I don't have a problem with that. Um, obviously, I'm teaching it a little bit differently, but um, you know, you take my yoke upon you I look at that as, as doing some level of work. But I suppose you could look at that and just say, well, he's just bringing me along with him, right? But I look at this, I, I think, like I said, I think I'm right, um, that this is talking about after you're saved, you know, he gives you rest. But when we learn of Jesus, we can look at how he works. We work together with him because that's what being yoked up with Jesus is. We're going forth with Jesus through the power of Christ. You know, that's the only way we're going to bring people to Christ. That's the only way we're going to labor in his field and, and bring people to him is that we can't do it all on our own. But you know what? Jesus isn't doing it all on his own either. So we get yoked up together with him and go and do the work. And we learn of him and he's going to show us. But he says, look, I'm meek. I'm lowly in heart. Learn of me. Well, that's how we need to be. We need to be meek. We need to be humble. We need to be lowly in heart. And you know what? That's how we're going to reach people. With Jesus yoked up together with us, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, not being proud and haughty and talking down to people, but being meek and lowly and humble and willing to do the work. And ultimately, you know what? He says, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Is it really that hard? It's not. Maybe you've never gone sowing before. You haven't, you haven't done the work. It's really not that hard. It's not. It's pretty easy. I mean, think about it. I think people make, make more of a big deal of it than it is as far in the sense of it being some, oh man, some difficult thing. That's all just made up in your mind. People who you think, oh, well, I couldn't imagine you know, opening up my mouth to somebody and talking to them or knocking on some stranger's door. It's actually really easy because it's only as difficult as however hard it is to walk and to reach out your hand and, either, and, and you know these days it's even easier because you, you don't even have to knock on the door you can press a doorbell because right? that's even easier and then however hard it is to use your voice none of those things are actually difficult it's a little bit of walking a little bit you know a little bit of talking you do that all the time anyways all the time now, just because the subject matter may change doesn't all of a sudden make it really difficult and hard. No. It's, it's still the same way. And we, need to, we should view it as such. Hey, this is easy. I mean, this, is, this really isn't that hard. And, oh, man, I'm doing so much. Look, you're talking to people. I'm trying to show them, show them the gospel of Jesus Christ. My yoke is easy. He said, my burden is light. Let's yoke up together with Jesus Christ and learn of him. Learn of him. Let, let's get to know him. Not some false expectation of who we think he should be. That's the way that leads you into idolatry. You're making up your own gods. How about we just learn who Jesus is through his word and by doing his word. It's about right to have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for all the instruction we could get. Your, your words are so full of wisdom, dear God. Um, I pray that you would please help us to understand more about you. 
Lord, we don't, we don't want to have an incorrect um, vision of you. We don't want to have an incorrect idea or, or um, knowledge of who you are, Lord. Help us to, to get to know you better and better. And uh, Lord, as we, as we strive to dry, nigh unto, draw nigh unto you, I pray that you would please just draw nigh unto us as you promised, Lord. And um, God, help us just to, to reach souls and, and to walk the way that Jesus Christ walked, giving us an example that we could be lowly and, and meek and humble. And uh, God, we love you and we thank you so much for, for your words and for your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.